welcome. We've got a few people getting some drinks over there, but I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Can you all hear me okay? All right. Oh, thank you, Craig. I th we, should, we should make that your regular duties here, I think. I think you did that last time as well. Hi, welcome. Good afternoon. I'm Becky O'Brien. I'm the chair of the uh, uh, communications subcommittee of RAC. And I just wanted to um, say hello and welcome and uh, want to recognize any newcomers. If we have people, it's your first time here today at RAN. If you'd stand up so we can welcome you. We have we've got a few over here. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, and also a reminder, we've got uh, uh, remote viewers as well. Hello. And um, if we have questions during the, during the um, session today, we'll have the person up here repeating that so that we can have the uh, remote viewers hear it as well. Um, I also want to thank the RAC subcommittee members, the people who put this uh, event on. So if the RAC subcommittee members could please stand up. Thank you all. And Chris, not even standing up, but he is also a linchpin in this. Um, and uh, just a few reminders. So we have name tags and sign-in sheets uh, at the table. If you please, you know, put your name and where you're from on, on the name tag and please sign in. Um, we, we definitely use that information, so it would be helpful. Um, and the, uh, we are remote uh, live streaming at the moment, but we are also recording, and so this will be available um, on the uh, ORSP website afterwards. Um, not immediately afterwards, but it'll be available afterwards along with the slides. Um, so please check it out there. And I will introduce uh, Daryl. He is our MC for today, Daryl Weinert. Um, he is the uh, Associate Vice President for Research and Business Operations. Thanks, Daryl. All right, thank you, Becky. So welcome everyone. Uh, I think we've got agendas on each table, but to remind everyone, today's RAN meeting's a bit foreshortened because we then have, following the RAN meeting, the celebratory event for the UMore uh, Staff Award. So I certainly hope all of you will follow us from this ballroom across the hallway to the Vandenberg Room for that, what's always a very fun celebratory event, and some good hors d'oeuvres and drinks as well. So. What we're going to do today is have a bit of a bicentennial theme. And I, I hope all of you by now are aware that the university this year is celebrating its 200th anniversary, uh, founded in 1817. So if you haven't before, I encourage you to visit the university's bicentennial website. And for those of you uh, who are older, like me, you might recall when the nation celebrated its bicentennial back in 1976, and they had on television periodically, as I recall it, these bicentennial minutes or whatever, and they talk about different things in the history of the United States. So we're going to do a bit of that today, sprinkled throughout the, the various presentations, with more of a theme on the history of the University of Michigan as it pertains to research. So. Again, the first thing I'm going to highlight is the university was founded in 1817. Its first building was located in uh, downtown Detroit. And then, as many of you know, uh, in 1837 is when the university then actually moved permanently here to Ann Arbor. Uh, and we kind of trace the beginnings of the university as a research institution to 1854, uh, when the Detroit Observatory was opened. And I'm going to put on my glasses because I'm realizing I'm having a challenge reading this little print here. Um, but the observatory was founded exclusively for scientific study, and it helped transform, again, U of M into at least the, the seeds of a research university. And then in 1856, we actually opened the first chemistry laboratory uh, at any university uh, in the United States. And then 
on the national scale, I don't have a, a slide for this, but really the foundation for research universities across the university took its first step in 1862, with many of you may know about the Morrill Act, which basically created the land grant universities uh, in each state. And it also, and probably more importantly from the research standpoint, started encouraging engineering and agriculture as key topics of study and inquiry at the nation's universities. So I think from a nationwide standpoint, we can trace to 1862 as kind of the, again, whisperings of the modern research university. And then finally, before moving on, um, or no, I guess I got one more, but in 1904, the tow tank, which is still in existence in the West Engineering Building, uh, was built and inaugurated, and it was the first such tank owned and operated by an educational institution. And it's pretty cool. If you ever have the chance to get a little tour of that facility, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And then finally, uh, 1934, again, a highlight of U of M's research history. U of M scientists Pearl Kendrick and Grace Elderling began testing a new vaccine for pertussis also known as whooping cough. And it worked, and it all but ended the scourge of whooping cough deaths uh, worldwide. So again, something for U of M to be proud of. And with that, something else for U of M to be proud of is Brian Van Sickle, who I'm going to turn the podium over to for an update on sponsored programs. How do I get my slides? Just click ahead. Oh, just click ahead. I should have expected they would have it all taken care of. Ta-da! So I'm Brian Van Sickle from Sponsor Programs. I have not been up on the podium since Craig and I did our Gilligan's Island routine. I've been here so long I try and stand behind the scenes as much as possible these days, but Deb Talley, our director, had a conflict and was not able to be here. I think she was just afraid that someone was going to bring her some type of a crown this time to go along with her queen of sponsored administration role. Um, so like Daryl, I do remember the bicentennial for the United States. Of course, I was only seven at the time. So my fondest memory is the fun bicentennial license plates. Oh my gosh, Scott Stanfield is here and he's got a jacket on. Scott, please stand up. <laughs> and a tie. I might have to make you come up on stage so that we can get this on camera for those who aren't able here to see it. They probably thought, he's going to pass out because I've known Scott for a couple of decades and I don't know that I've ever seen the man with a tie on. He's really proud of his staff member who's giving an award today, as we all are, Carrie Disney. Yay! So speaking of decades of experience at the institution, there are a lot of new faces in the audience today, some of whom are new administrators. In fact, I just got introduced to my first third generation research administrator for, uh, in my entire career, which is kind of cool. Uh, but I was hoping that if we have anybody in the audience who's been a research admin for, uh, let's say, more than 20 years, stand up. Come on, you all, stand up. I know you can still do it. <laughs> Wait, don't sit down yet. Don't sit down yet. Okay. More than 25 years? All right. Another round of applause. More than 30 years? Oh. All right, Sally. How many years has it been? 33. 33. All right. Darren will get your prize to you at the end of today's session. <laughs> uh, so Deb was able to do some prep work for the slides, and she likes to use the university resources. So in sponsored programs, I'm the most senior person, and I only have 25 years. So she had to go to the Bentley website to find some data. Uh, so some of the things that she discovered on the Bentley site uh, was that back in the 50s, you know, we were accepting awards from the federal government. Uh, most of the federal research activity really took off after World War II. Uh, 
1953, we had money coming in for the Phoenix Project, uh, which is some of the funding that allowed the university to actually have a nuclear reactor on campus for a number of decades. Not very many people are aware of that these days. Uh, in 1957, our total volume of research was $10 million. Um, last year, does anyone remember what our total volume was? One point what? $1.34 billion. Yeah, so a little bit of growth in that 60-year time period. Um, in 1962, the university had more NASA money than any other university across the Testing, testing, all right, y'all, calm down. This is almost as bad as Simone Biles getting voted out of Dancing with the Stars this week. I am still kind of broken up about that, so if I start crying, you'll know why. Anyway, so we had a lot of NASA money, yada, 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 got that part down. All right, so then in, at this point in time is when the collective memory about uh, the predecessor to sponsored programs starts, i.e. we have somebody who's worked here for over 40 years and we ask them. So the office that is currently known as sponsored programs uh, back in the 70s was lodged on North Campus at the research building. And in fact, at that time, that was the same location where DRDA also spent their office hours. And then they ran out of space on North Campus, as sometimes happens, I understand. And so they started getting moved across the institution. So they moved from North Campus to the West Engine Building. Then they ran out of room there, so they got moved to the ISR Building. Then they got moved out of there. And for a brief period of time, we were in what's known as the Burr Building, which is over on Hoover and Green, which is a warehouse which is where I used to work when I started, and Carol was there at the same time, and it was a converted warehouse, like trucks going in and out, and we had old cubicles that upon occasion would spontaneously catch fire. But <laughs> we knew where the fire extinguishers were, so it was all fine. And then in 1996, the university had purchased the Wolverine Tower, and when we moved to the Wolverine Tower, we changed our name for the first time, from federal funds, because at that point we only took care of federal projects, and we joined with the part of financial operations that handled the non-federal sponsored agreements, so all the foundations and industry awards, and that's when we became sponsored programs. And we stayed sponsored programs the whole time, even though DRDA changed their name to confuse everybody. <laughs> but we'll talk about that on a different time. And then in 2012, please take notes, we separated or emancipated, probably emancipated is a better analogy, from financial operations and now sponsored programs reports directly to the vice president the same as financial operations does. So for all those people who stood up from 20 and more years, please stop calling me FinOps because I don't work at FinOps anymore. I only work in sponsored programs. All right, so off of the history lesson, I was hoping Daryl was going to wear one of those bicentennial hats today because those were awesome from the 70s. Maybe he's got one down here. Nope, I don't see it. Um, so update, I think Deb mentioned in January that we had, we're working on closing out our single audit for last year. It's done. It's up on the website. The link is here on the slide. Uh, we had a couple of findings, uh, one that was related to the Fly America Act for compliance, and it was an issue with a faculty member who was doing their best to save the university and the federal government money. Someone should have told them that that's not what the government's interested in. Uh, you know, they went to Windsor to fly to Europe to save a few bucks, and instead we ended up having to cover the cost of that ticket from university resources. Uh, but other than that, the audit was perfectly clear, and uh, we're in fact prepping to get ready for this year's audit field work. And I will let you lucky individuals know if one of your projects gets selected because I always like to pass that information out just to share that joy that we have from working with the audit staff. Uh, the most of the rest of our updates is about personnel. So pretty much I would just say everyone in the room has had a message from me or one of my staff in the last couple of months letting you know that your customer service rep has changed. And that's because we've had some movement um, from people leaving sponsored programs, people getting promotions, and all of that. 
Uh, so I will briefly just mention, so Dean Mahalik from our team uh, was promoted to a customer service consultant position. Um, that was directly as a result of Matt Mueller being hired by the Office of Financial Aid. So Matt is no longer with our team. He is on campus making sure that everyone gets the right Pell Grant amount. Uh, David Thompson from our reporting staff joined our customer service team. And then I'm happy to report that Mary Swatek um, has come back to sponsored programs from a brief journey to the College of Engineering. So usually I get up here and complain to the schools and colleges that you steal all of our people, which is still somewhat true. But at least in the last year, I've stolen a couple back. So this is where I go this, na 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 na. In fact, could all the customer service staff please stand? So most of them are here today, and if you have a new one, you might want to try and catch them between now and the awards ceremony. So Diane, Elaine, Michelle, Lisa, Amanda, Christy, Prentice, Jean, David, Scott, and Dean. Don't ask me why the guys always try and sit in close proximity to each other. I think it's because there aren't very many of them, but uh, in addition, <laughs> this will make you clap too. We had nine new reporting staff members start last week. So <laughs> uh, they will be finishing training up in the next couple of weeks and then they'll be sending reports to you all. Um, best of luck. And last but not least, we had a new staff member start in our, sing, our UG, or previously known as A21 team, and her name's Kelly Galpin. So there's a lot of new faces in sponsored programs these days. And in addition, uh, we had a new person start from ITS who came to work with our RAC group on our training efforts, and that's David Nasser. David, you want to raise your hand, stand up? And if you're keeping track, yes, that is the third David that we have working in our office. So it makes it a little confusing some days. Uh, last a couple updates. Uh, briefly, uh, the financial PeopleSoft system is doing a behind the scenes kind of update this coming weekend. Uh, it's similar to some of the e-research updates. It's not supposed to be viewable or noticeable to anybody on campus other than that the system will be down from Saturday night until Sunday. Uh, so hopefully come Monday morning, it looks just like it did Friday afternoon and there's not any issues. And then the last is just a brief update about the new sub-project grant request form. We've made a modification to it. It's extremely tiny. So if you could see at the very bottom of this form is the address of where the file's located. And then it tells you where to email it to. We created a new me email address spnewsubs at umich.edu. Uh, previous form had it going to our front desk who then had to forward it to our folks that do the new sub creation and we thought why not eliminate the middleman. All right, so I have the great pleasure of introducing Carolyn Pappas from ITS. Afternoon. I'm filling in for Kathy Handyside, who is away at a conference, but she was kind enough to prepare all the slides for me. Um, and it looks like, there we go. I'm going to start with an IT history, and I have some notes because most of these things um, predate my time here and even um, my lifetime. So in, um, in 1919, the university um, purchased its first key punch machines, and this was used for record keeping and accounting, and by all purposes, it is the first IT kind of system. Um, and there were lots of things that happened in between, but we're just going to hit the highlights. In 1946, out at Willow Run, we acquired the labs. And um, they were originally owned by the War Department. And essentially, this became the first site for the computing at the University of Michigan out at the um, Willow Run Labs. And then in 1953, um, the first relatively, I guess it would be a computer, was purchased from the US Air Force. And this is the MIDAC, not to be confused with MIDAR. 
Um, this is a Michigan Digital Automatic Computer. And again, that was located at Willow Run. In uh, 1956, we had the Regents approve the first IBM computer. Back then, I guess, the Regents had to approve purchases of computers. And essentially, this was the first computer that was available for general use. And it also was used for research computing and um, some instruction. It wasn't until 1984 that Information Technology Division was created. And this combined a computing center, the Office of Administrative Systems, uh, Center for Information Technology, Integration, and another Office of Instructional Technology. And you'll see as I go through here, um, we seem to combine systems, then we take them apart, and then we combine them again. So that's, that seems to be one of our themes. Um, in 1994, Wolverine Access came on board. It was designed and released actually in 1996. And this was first to allow students to have access to grades, their class schedules, academic reports, um, they could see the availability of classes, and you could also get some account statements. Um, and these were also, um, you could access these in the campus computing sites on the old Macintosh computers. And those were one of the first personal computers here. Um, it wasn't until 1996 that M Pathways was in, um, initiated. And if for those of you, uh, probably many of you remember this, um, M Pathways was a project that was charged with the design and implementation of new administrative information systems. Laura Patterson was the project manager, and she said what we are talking about is changing the way university conducts its administrative processes so that they better serve our students, staff, faculty, and citizens of the state. And with that in mind, um, we continued and created um, the MAZE system. That was back in 2000. Many of you probably remember MAZE. Um, it was a system that was created to provide support to units and um, schools and colleges for new information technology systems, such as the beloved M Pathways. And this is the part I remember. Um, 2005, the first e-research system came online, and it was the regulatory management, which um, is for the human subjects review and approval. In uh, 2009, we did a, another uh, transformation, and we brought some of the IT systems together, and um, we now call ourselves ITS. Along, um, this somehow did not appear on the screen, but probably, um, to be noted, in 2009, the next e-research system came online, e-research proposal management. And that's the update I'm going to give you today. So we have had two uh, vendor upgrades, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about our high-level proposed enhancement schedule. We did an upgrade back in March, and then we did another upgrade um, a couple weeks ago in May. And that's probably the one you noticed most when you signed in on Monday morning. It looked a lot different. Hopefully, it wasn't uh, too different functionally. Um, I want to point out um, a couple things here. One of the things that we did with our update is we, try, we are aligning all four e-research systems to look and feel uh, similar. So we made some changes, so um, proposal management looks a lot like regulatory management, and as the other two systems get upgraded, they'll look similar as well. One thing that changed is the My Home button is no longer in the top right by your name, but it's now in the top menu. So you have to know that when you click My Home, um, it's just moved, it has the same functionality, however. The other thing that changed is the um, breadcrumbs, where you used to see them displayed on the top left. You now have to click the path with the little arrow button in order to see the breadcrumbs. This is an example of a 424 workspace, and you also have the option to click on the parent project to go back to the path, or you could click on the, the, um, my, the path to go back to the path. So with our um, 
upgrade, we are doing one small release um, this coming Monday that should be um, not noticeable to anyone. Um, we had a couple things that we didn't fit in our May 5th update, so we're going we're gonna to do them on Monday. And then after that, we're going to go back to our regular enhancement schedule. We have one scheduled for the end of June, and on that one, we're going to do some updates to export control security. They need to be um, accessible only to people who need to see them, so they can't be as open as the rest of the UFAs are. And then we're going to do um, some updates to the agreement acceptance request form, also known as the AAR. And we anticipate splitting that over the next two releases. Um, the next thing we're doing in September, um, this was approved by the, um, well, I guess what group, would it, Iraq Executive Committee as well as the RADs on the PATH transparency. So this is opening up the PATH to uh, allow other people who um, may not have access today access to, to see it in the future. And that um, is it for my updates. Are there any questions? Okay. Then it is my pleasure to introduce Craig Reynolds from Office of Research and Sponsored Programs. Hi, everyone. Good to see you all again. So first of all, let me just assure you that none of what I'm about to share is code word classified. Um, and I hate to correct Carolyn, but it's the Office of Research and Sponsored Projects. It's this fellow, Brian, over here that's sponsored <laughs> programs. That's okay. That's okay. It, it's, a, it's a common enough mistake. So. Um, our history, so let me just start by saying we trace our history back to 1920. Can you believe it? Um, as the Department of Engineering Research that was established by the Regents and companies that want to come to uni the University of Michigan paid a fee for the services of the uh, Department of Engineering Research, so uh, for carrying out uh, sponsored research. So that's really the, the start of our story was um, quite a few years ago, huh? Anyone remember that, 1920? <laughs> so in 1948, uh, the Department of Engineering Research became the Engineering Research Institute. This is, so 1948, that's two years before the National Science Foundation was established. Coincidence? I think not. 1958, ERI, Engineering Research Institute, became the University of Michigan Research Institute and expanded its services from the College of Engineering or the Department of Engineering to the rest of campus. So it was truly more like the ORSP that you know today. So that was 1958. 1959, the Vice President for Research position, currently um, Jack Hu was created, that position in 1959, and, and that was only three years before JFK said that we were going to send, send a man to the moon. Coincidence? I think not. In 1961, um, UMRI became DRDA. Oh, I'm sorry. Came, became, I'm giving away the story here. The, the Office of Research Administration, 1961. In 1973, the same year that Nixon said he was not a crook, uh, ORA became DRDA. And that name stuck for about 40 years. But we can't leave well enough alone. Um, in 1993, we moved over into Wolverine Tower on the south side of town. Um, I, I skipped over a bunch of different offices that we were in prior to 1993. We were in East Engineering, West Engineering, ISR, the Cooley Building, the Markley House. Um, I might be missing one. Um, itinerant group of folks, uh, research administrators, who have finally found a home in, in WOTO, and we're, we're happy to be there. Uh, and especially since uh, Daryl Weiner managed to get some new, new uh, paint and carpeting and, and pictures on the floor that were from 1993, I believe. <laughs> uh, and then in 2012, DRDA became the Office of Research and Sponsored Projects. <laughs> Only two years later, Kim Kardashian and Kanye West were married. Coincidence? I think not. So in 2020, we will be celebrating our centennial. 
uh, which is kind of a, a watershed event for us. I don't know what we have planned, but stay tuned. I'm sure it will be fantastic. So <laughs> that's the history of ORSP. Um, Kathy DeWitt, so staff updates. Let's give a round of applause to Kathy DeWitt. <laughs> She didn't even stand. She's over in the corner, but we're going to be celebrating her and a number of other folks across the hall. Um, Kathy, I was going to say that she started an ORSP bef before this time timeline began, but actually <laughs> it was 1999, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right, Kathy? That's right. And so we're, we're very proud of Kathy, and she's a well-deserved honor. Um, I'll also, I'll, a little plug for Lark Harner, one of the project reps in ORSP. Lark, are you here today? Yes. Stand up, Lark. So, yeah, uh, Lark finished the Boston Marathon, and did anybody buy tickets to the gun show? Uh, <laughs> Lark is never going to get in trouble because I, in my office because I'm scared to death. <laughs> uh, you've already met Dave, um, but here's a picture of him as well. Uh, and also, I want to point out that um, Laura Dickey, who is our data and reporting manager, who was acknowledged on a slide back in, I think, September or so, but wasn't actually here to be recognized, has joined our office, and Laura's over there in, in, the, in the corner in the white shirt. So welcome, Laura. So I'm, I'm keeping up on time, I think. So you, you, you just heard the, the update from Carolyn regarding um, some of the changes to e-research, uh, proposal management, ERPM. Uh, Carolyn and a number of other folks continue to do uh, yeoman's work in the, developing all of the specifications and requirements for the new award management system. So the ERPM team, that's Carolyn and Kate Strempeck and Latanya Woods and Kathy Handyside are really the core folks that are, are doing all of the legwork to make sure that we design an award management system that is going to be responsive to our needs. Uh, so thank you to you guys. Um, we've adjusted our timeline a little bit, um, looking at April 1 of 2018, we hope, as the go-live date, and using the period between January 1st and March 31st as a training in communications change management. So we'll all be learning, myself included, how to use this new system um, in the early part of 2018 and going live in April. So look forward to that. I know I certainly am. Uh, Carolyn also mentioned that the agreement acceptance request is going to have some enhancements coming up in June and later in September. Um, I'm really looking forward to that because I have yet to have one that worked. So um, we're really excited about the enhancements. Um, everyone is, I think, about that. Um, the last time I was up here, I shared with you our, our latest and best thinking on the internal deadline policy. Well, I've been talking about this policy now for over a year. Um, and it's going to happen, I'm telling you guys. It just might not happen the way you heard it last time because we've been giving feedback as we socialize, if you will, the, the concept and the, the details of this policy across campus. And we've been getting a lot of good feedback, and so um, we have um, put some pretty significant tweaks into our approach and most recently shared that approach with the executive committee of RAC and are waiting their feedback and will continue to socialize it and, and meet with faculty and research administrators, including the folks here at uh, RAN. So just know it's still coming. It might not take the form that you thought that, that you, you heard, but it, you, there will be a deadline policy. And as we, as we rethink our approach, of course, the, de the deadline for when that is actually going to go live tends to tends to be delayed because we have to communicate and, 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 and make sure that we're hearing from all of the folks that have uh, an input as a stakeholder. Uh, for those of you that do work in um, human subjects research, there's, there's two important things here. One is the National Institutes of Health has required that any multi-site clinical trial that's funded um, with an application of September 25th, 17 or later is required to use a single IRB of record. So that might be a commercial IRB that we contract with or if we keep it in-house. Uh, that's a mandate from NIH. It's also actually part of the new common rule that was uh, put into place uh, early this year, except for the fact that um, the, the current administration has decided to take a look at this particular regulation to see whether or not it's going to stand. So um, we don't know if it's going to be a requirement outside of NIH, but it certainly will be a requirement within NIH. 
And so I'm, I'm working with Debbie Talley and, and, and another of, a number of other folks to help put out some guidance to you all on, on how you actually budget for a single IRB um, situation with working with an NIH proposal for a multi-site clinical trial. Uh, so here, you'll be hearing more about that soon. Um, the uniform guidance, we've been talking about this micro-purchase threshold now ever since the uniform guidance was first on the radar. Um, well, what can I say now? Oh, so um, yes, yesterday? No, today. Today in the Federal Register, um, there was an announcement that the procurement standards, which include the micro-purchase threshold, were, are going to be delayed for yet another year. So um, at, at, um, at the outset, it's going to be July 1st of 2018 that the procurement standards go into effect. But if you recall, there were two laws that I referenced the last time I was up here that established the micro-purchase threshold at $10,000, which is what ours currently is. So we're looking to get some f real uh, firm, some firm guidance from, from OMB and COGR, the Council on Governmental Relations, uh, just to make sure that we're comfortable uh, sticking with the 10K micro-purchase threshold. I would imagine that it's going to stay that way, but um, I'll be able to definitively say uh, whether or not we can do that the next time we meet, or maybe the time after that, or maybe the time after that. We'll, we'll see. Uh, the federal research terms and conditions were released March 14th of 2017. Uh, if you recall, with the uniform guidance, the old research terms and conditions went away. Um, and we've just been patiently waiting for the new ones to come online, and they are now uh, in effect, but not all of the agencies uh, have adopted the research terms and conditions, and those that are adopting the RTCs, if you will, um, are doing it at different times of the year. So DOD, for example, is not adopting the, the research terms and conditions, but NSF and NIH already have. Other federal agencies are adopting the RTCs l throughout the year, I think the latest being November. So um, if you go to that URL that's in the slide here, you will see the implementation plans of all of the agencies and when they expect to adopt the RTCs. And I know Constance put out a, a rapid to let folks know the same. If you haven't heard already, the National Science Foundation uh, is, re is requiring, put that in air quotes, requiring um, that we use a, a, an Excel template for identifying all of the collaborators and other affiliations. Uh, there's more information um, on the URL there. And the, the, the salary cap was announced um, not too long ago, well, more than, more than a couple months ago for uh, setting it at 187K. So that's it for ORSP update. How am I doing on time? Not bad, I'm okay, all right. So, so any questions? That's good news, okay. so. Um, I believe I have this really complicated transition sheet that I'm supposed to follow. So, uh, but I, I, I do follow directions, but sometimes I have to read. Um, so uh, I'm, still on, I'm still up. We're going to talk about professional development, I believe. And um, I'm going to talk first of, all, first of all about what's new at the National Council of University Research Administrators. Uh, so first, in, first up is the annual meeting, which is always in D.C., always in the the Washington Hilton, where, where Reagan was shot, uh, where, that's a happy note, um, where, the, where they used to have the White House cor Correspondence Dinner until last year. Uh, beautiful hotel, um, and that's coming up August 6th through the 9th in D.C. Uh, early bird registration closes soon, so if you have a plan to go, I would encourage you to do that. Now, something that's relatively new, I think they started it last year, is they actually now have on-site daycare. So if you want to bring your family to D.C. Um, and you don't have a spouse who's willing to watch the kids, apparently, uh, or, or anyone else, um, there is an opportunity for professional daycare to be provided at the meeting, which, is, which I think is a very family-friendly uh, thing for them to do. So that might, may, might make it possible when it wasn't before. Um, we have the Financial Research Administration uh, annual meeting and the pre-award research annual meeting coming, uh, well, in March, first week of March of next year, and that's in beautiful San Juan, Puerto Rico. So put that on your calendar and start, start lobbying your boss to send you. Um, we also have the regional... <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sorry. We also, we also have the annual regional meeting in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, April 
15th through the 18th of 2018. And actually, I'm told I've never been to Iowa, uh, let alone Des Moines, but I'm told it's a beautiful city. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's the, the region has never been to Iowa, so that was one of the, the, the driving considerations in, in selecting the city. So it's good room rate, good location. I encourage you to, to go. Um, a number of new uh, webinars that have been released are available on the Encura website. If you have an interest, I would encourage you to check those out. Um, and I'm going to move on to an SRA update as well, since um, Kathy Sayostrowski couldn't be here today. Um, she's not the queen of she, she, she let's call her the Duchess of Research Administration. She couldn't be here today, so we have a video that I'm going to try to make work. Hello, RAND community. This is Kathy C. Ostrowski, the Department Administrator in Biomedical Engineering and an absolute ambassador for research administration. I am here to talk to you about your involvement in professional organizations in research administration, and specifically the Society of Research Administrators International. As many of you know, I currently serve as the president of the Michigan chapter of this organization, and we would love to get you involved. SRA is one of the top two global research administrators professional societies, and they offer international, section, and chapter meetings. One of the advantages of getting to know SRAI is that there are a variety of educational offerings going on pretty much every day of the month, including webinars, topical trainings held at key sites, committee engagement, and of course annual meetings. Many of us have just returned from Nashville, Tennessee, where the joint Midwest Southern Section meeting was held last week. This was a fantastic meeting at an awesome conference site. Congratulations to Heather Krause of LSNA, who just concluded her service as Section President and in pulling off such a fantastic meeting, where I would say probably 20 plus U of M members were in attendance. Right now, we are planning for the Michigan Chapter Conference that is going to be held on Friday, June 23rd at our own U of M Dearborn. The Chapter Conferences are a great place to get involved and actually try your hand at presenting a session or serving on a panel or just volunteering. Registration for this conference is right now underway and at $135 for the whole day and a complimentary dinner networking gathering at Buddy's Pizzeria in Dearborn the night before, it's quite a bargain for those just getting interested in professional development beyond their role in the university. Michigan SRA is just the spot for those of you who are just starting out. One of the hallmarks of meetings in SRAI is that they are held in several locations, giving individuals an opportunity to travel a bit while learning more about their trade. SRA's annual meeting will be held this upcoming October in Vancouver, British Columbia. So if you'd like more information about the local Michigan Chapter Conference or how to get involved in SRA at the state, section, or international level, please email me at kathyso at umich.edu. You can also contact incoming president Ruth Halsey or Melissa Carby, who is our current secretary. Ruth and Melissa are probably right there at the meeting with you right now. We are all ambassadors for SRA and research administration, and we'd really love to personally help you get involved. Check out the website at www.srainternational.org. Oh. <laughs> See you at the chapter conference in Dearborn, June 23, 2017. Okay. Thank you, Kathy Esso. We miss you. Um, let me let me make this thing do what it's supposed to do. I'm just going to randomly <laughs> watch watch me watch me fail. Constance to the right to the right. Present. That's supposed to say slideshow. Okay, so that's it for SRA and Encura. I now want to introduce the Baroness of Research Development, Jill Jevedan, who's going to talk more about NORDIP and some special on-campus activities. Is that right? So welcome, Jill. Thank 
you, everyone. That's a tough act to follow. This is the second day in a row I've had to follow Craig, and uh, it's getting tough. Um, so my name is Jill Jividen. I'm the Assistant Director for Research Development uh, for the Medical School and the Office of Research over there. And uh, I want to talk to you about uh, NORDUP, and thank you for having me. I know some of you have seen these slides before. Uh, we are in a position, because this is an emerging field, where we actually have to define it a little bit for you about how it's different from research administration. Uh, this organization, NORDUP, actually wrote the Wikipedia page for research development. And so these uh, four adjectives are uh, what they use to describe it. And it includes activities like uh, developing and improving resources to help faculty be successful in getting their external funding. Uh, anything, any gaps that you see, uh, the needs of faculty, any way that you can help uh, fill those in a strategic way, helping with large scale proposal management, um, grant writing review, technical writing, uh, editing assistance, facilitating collaborations, uh, speed networking would be a great um, example, mentorship programs, things like that. Uh, NORDUP just had our conference, we had our annual conference last week. Uh, it was the ninth annual conference. It's still a very new organization compared to SRA and Ankura, uh, so only around 10 years old. Um, it is growing exponentially. It has gone from 60 members to over 800 members in just around nine or 10 years. Um, last week, we had the largest conference ever at 491 um, at registered. I don't know if that many showed up, but that many registered and paid for, to come. And uh, the largest contingent from U of M so far. So uh, it's really exciting to see the interest in this growing on campus as well. Uh, to sort of uh, describe more, and I know many of you have seen this slide before, this is very broad strokes. And uh, the thing about U of M is that we have a very strong research administration infrastructure here. Um, hundreds of you are doing research administrative activities, but many of you are also doing research development activities without calling it research development. And so the way we sort of parse this out is to, I think of research development as pre-pre-award activities, right? You're thinking um, about the skills and the tools that you can give faculty to help them be more competitive in getting that grant funding. Um, but I know many of you, especially in small schools and colleges, are doing all of this, right? The School of Information, they do both admin and development. Uh, the School of Social Work, uh, many of the institutes on campus. Foundation Relations is, uh, is basically a research development organization uh, where they're doing these activities to help faculty get their funding. Um, I also wanted to add that there are uh, increasing research development opportunities, positions that have opened up over the last couple of years. Uh, the School of Education now has a dedicated RD person. Uh, many of the institutes, MSERC, uh, MISHAR has their research development core, Earwig, and uh, ISR all have research development uh, positions in their, um, in their units. So we have really started to build a research development community on campus, and um, we think of this as sort of an informal chapter of NORDUP. NORDUP doesn't yet have formal chapters, and so we're starting to, uh, to build this from scratch. We have a core team that is uh, around 20 people right now. We'd like it to be representative of all the schools and units uh, across campus, and we're getting there. Uh, but we use it to talk about strategic initiatives, uh, ways that we can collaborate together, share resources, best practices, things that we're doing that, uh, that we can discuss together. Um, and we also have a listserv now. Uh, so all the people that have attended our events and that have expressed interest in learning more about research development, we now have over 100 of you on this listserv where we can put out uh, job opportunities and, uh, and resources and um, can share information. There'll be some opportunities uh, to work with us on committees, event planning, and that sort of thing. You can email me if you want to get on this listserv. And that brings me to uh, this, uh, we are having our second annual research development conference on campus. It is a uh, half day on June 13th. Uh, my collaborators don't know this yet, but as of this morning, we have 116 people registered for this event. So I am thrilled with the positive response uh, that we've gotten that people want to learn about research development that they see it as a potential path. I came up through research administration and moved into research development, and it was, it's sort of a natural uh, path, um, you know, to uh, just something different and challenging and, um, and exciting, uh, and those were where my interests took me. So um, this is uh, a, an opportunity for you to learn more about it and see if this is a good fit for you, too. 
This year we have uh, a keynote speaker. Dave Stone is joining us. Uh, he's the Associate Vice President at Oakland University. He's one of the past presidents of NORDA. And uh, so he will be our keynote. We are providing breakfast for you. As I said, this is a free event. And then we are running concurrent panels so that you can choose the panel that you want to attend that aligns with your interests. If you're just getting started or you're, you just want to find out more about research development, um, uh, these are ideas that you can take back to your units, uh, models of things that we're doing, resources that we have that we want to share. Uh, so we're really excited uh, about this. This is my last slide. You can contact me if you have information. Uh, that is our listserv uh, email address. So you can email that if you want to get added to uh, the list. Uh, there are the event details. You can go to this website to register. I guess the two or three of you that have not yet registered <laughs> already. And uh, I want to thank all of our collaborators. I probably will be asking you for more money because this is such a big event. Um, but uh, UMOR is giving us some funding. Uh, my Office of Research, Mishar, College of Engineering, Foundation Relations, School of Information, ISR, LSA, U of M Dearborn. We also have planning help from the U of M Library and uh, an earwig and um, Forgetting some school of, school of education. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> and uh, that is it for me. And I'm going to hand the microphone back over to Daryl. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you, Jill. Let's see. Am I going the wrong way? I am. So back to our Bicentennial Minutes, and I want to first thank, so I had this idea of having this meeting focus on the Bicentennial a couple of weeks ago, and then I left on travel. So I handed over to Chris DeVries all the groundwork to kind of put this together. Uh, so he really helped develop with David Lampy from the Office of Research, the slides on the U of M history, and then I want to thank Brian and Craig and, and Carolyn for being good sports to also follow the theme and, and dig back in the records a bit for each of those offices. I hope all of you are finding it interesting. I think it is fun to reflect occasionally on the, the path we've charted over the last decades. So anyhow, to continue that theme, uh, we now get into the, the World War II era. And I, I want to point out at a national level this was really probably the seminal moment in the development of the modern research university. And many of you know um, this history, but essentially, as I've had it told to me, in World War I, um, the Department of Defense, wasn't even called that then, um, had an attempt to really better coalesce national research, particularly around how to, to make the United States Army more effective. And it was kind of a disaster, and it didn't work out well. And when World War II occurred, uh, FDR really went to his science advisor, Vannevar Bush, to figure out, is there a better way to do this? And essentially, um, Vannevar Bush was the father, I would say, of the modern research university. And I want to pull out a speech from Bill Clinton a few years back where he talked about this. So he said, after World War II, President Roosevelt directed his science advisor, Vannevar Bush, to determine how the remarkable wartime research partnership between universities and the government could be sustained in peace. And then a quote from Roosevelt, new frontiers of the mind are before us. If they are pioneered with the same vision, boldness, and drive with which we have waged the war, we can create a fuller and more fruitful employment and a fuller and more fruitful life. End of quote. So uh, as per Bill Clinton, Vannevar Bush helped to convince the American people that government must support science, that the best way to do it would be to fund the work of independent university researchers. This ensured that in our nation, scientists would be in charge of science. And where before university science relied largely on philanthropic organizations for support, now the national government would be a strong and steady partner. And I think the other key not mentioned in that quote is too, that it took the politics out of scientific funding. So I, who just said yay there? I think we all should say yay. Um, so in 1945, getting back to U of M's own research, uh, in 1945, U of M researchers from the School of Public Health collected and evaluated data from a study in Grand Rapids, Michigan 
testing the impact of fluoridated drinking water on tooth decay. Study outcomes were so promising that the U.S. Public Health Service established fluoridated programs nationwide in the 1960s. And then in 1949, uh, U of M established the Institute for Social Research. Uh, today, the Institute is the world's premier academic social research and survey organization, bringing together scientists from a broad range of disciplines to study social behavior. And a personal note about ISR, my father-in-law was there back in the late 1940s. He was here in, at U of M getting his doctorate in economics and was at the kind of the founding of the, what became then the Institute for Social Research. And I myself was an employee of ISR when I was a student here. Uh, I was involved on a, a survey they were doing of the library system, and it was a great uh, temporary job that paid reasonably well. So thank you, ISR. And then probably one of the more famous um, U of M uh, research history stories is in 1955. Uh, when then U of M professor Thomas Francis Jr. concluded the two-year national field trials of the Sock polio vaccine and on April 12th of that year announced to the world that the vaccine developed by his former student Jonas Salf is quote safe, effective, and potent. And then, uh, as was mentioned earlier, in 1957 the Ford nuclear reactor was constructed at U of M uh, becoming the largest nuclear reactor on a college campus. The swimming pool type reactor, I'm not sure anyone actually hopefully ever swam in that, was dedicated to investigating the peaceful uses of nuclear power. And as it was mentioned earlier, that was uh, associated with a significant for that time uh, donation from the Ford Motor Company. So with that, I think I'm handing it over to David Mulder for an update on Navigate and training. Good afternoon, everyone. I am David Mulder. I am the training manager for ORSP and sponsored programs. Carolyn, if you just say the acronym, you don't have to worry. Where are you? She left. She left in shame. Way to go uh, for ORSP and sponsored programs. And I'm just giving a quick update to you all today on um, our efforts over the next few months for the Navigate program. Um, so first of all, um, yesterday we concluded the latest um, round of the Navigate Fundamentals um, Research Administration Training Program. Um, so if there's anyone here today, this afternoon, who was either a participant in this late, latest cohort um, or was one of our trainers for that uh, round of classes, if you could please stand so that we can just acknowledge you, because thank you. Thank you. So it's a big commitment and we really appreciate it. Um, so um, we are planning right now on offering uh, rounds of the fundamentals program, our fundamentals course, both in the spring and the fall of each year. Um, so the next one will be offered starting in September. So uh, stay tuned to wrap and rapid announcements for details um, for registration on that. Um, also this summer, uh, we're planning on offering our uniform guidance cost principles course again in the July timeframe and then again in the fall in November. Um, we, earlier this year, piloted our um, first in a series, a planned series of advanced budgeting classes, um, which was successful, and so we were planning on offering that uh, advanced budgeting one class again this fall in about the October timeframe. Paired with that advanced budgeting one class, we are also planning on piloting, um, and yes, that's why it's a little airplane, um, a budgeting basics class in the September time frame and then um, an advanced budgeting two class in November. So the idea is that um, ultimately you would be able to take the entire uh, curriculum of budgeting classes in succession. Um, and there is also a budgeting, advanced budgeting three class that's in the works, but we don't have um, a time frame identified for that yet. In addition, we are planning on piloting a lunch and learn series in uh, June and then hopefully holding those roughly every other month going forward. Um, are there any questions that I can answer? All right, well then stay tuned to wrap and rapid announcements and also the Navigate portal on the ORSP site for additional information.
Um, and Daryl, I'm turning it back over to you. How are we doing on time, Chris? We're good? Because I have more bicentennial minutes. <laughs> no U of M presentation would be complete without a mention of football. So in 1969, U of M professor Richard Schneider co-patented a football helmet with an inflatable inner lining that was designed to reduce head injuries. And I heard Tom uh, Brady actually figured out a way to deflate the helmets. So, ooh, I'm getting hissed? Or is that just the air going out of your inflatable helmet? In 1979, um, U.S. President, then U.S. President Jimmy Carter presented the National Medal of Science to two U of M faculty members, Elizabeth Crosby, a neuroanatomist, and Emmett Leith, an electrical engineer, the father of uh, 3D holography. And I think we actually have had other Medal of Science awardees, but in 79 what was unique was we had two at the same time. And then in 1988, uh, we founded the Europe program, the Undergraduate Research Opportunity Program, which creates partnerships between undergraduate students and university researchers. Europe started with 14 student faculty partnerships and has now expanded to include more than 1,300 students, 800 faculty members in any given year. So it's pretty amazing. Uh, and then 1993, uh, U of M faculty member Francis S. Collins, co-discover of the genes for cystic fibrosis, neurofibromatosis, and Huntington's disease is named to lead the NIH Human Genome Project. And I think we all know what a remarkable uh, project that ended up being as well. So with that, I'm going to introduce our next presenter. Uh, Kristen, are you ready? So, but I do want to clarify. So the slide says early, um, and that was the previous name of this institute. It was the Institute for Research on Labor, Employment, and the Economy. It just flows off your tongue, right? So actually, a couple of months ago, uh, a few of us convened, and Paula Sorrell, the new director of early, uh, was pushing hard, and we came up with a new name, the Economic Growth Institute, which we think is both a better name, but also more reflective of what their actual mission is. But uh, Kristen's got a presentation for us on a specific program that um, the Economic Growth Institute helps to coordinate that should be of interest to some of your faculty researchers. Thanks, Sarah, and thank you so much for inviting me to come and talk about the program. It's called the Small Company Innovation Program, and we call it SKIP for short. The reason we w wanted to come and talk about this w is because um, it's a program that is excellent for companies and for universities, and we want to make sure that if you see one of the proposals come across your desk, you know what it is you know who to contact and also if you're currently working on one of our proposals this hopefully will help you to uh, just make your time much easier as Daryl mentioned we used to be called early the Institute for Research on Labor Employment and the Economy now we are the Economic Growth Institute and we primarily work with three different groups one is companies tech companies the second are companies that are important to the economy and the third is communities we've been around in one form or another for about 30 years and um, uh, we've managed quite a few federal and state programs so for skip as i mentioned Part of the Institute's goal is to work with tech companies, and the SKIP program, which is funded by the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, helps us to do that. Um, again, we want to foster relationships between industry in Michigan and academia, and the goal, since it's economic development, is to create jobs. So, at, at the Economic Growth Institute, we administer part of the program. The Business Engagement Center here at University of Michigan also does. 
and we have funding up to $40,000 that we can contribute to these projects and the university indirects are waived so it is a huge value to the companies. Um, so what we're trying to do is tap into university resources. And let me just say also, it's not just University of Michigan. It's all 15 public universities in the state. And although it's administered by the University of Michigan, we um, are very happy to work with all of the universities. Um, just to give you a couple of examples of what we've done here, um, you know, one is developing sensors for early cancer detection. Another one is, is helping to develop a drug for preemies who um, are at risk for blindness. Um, hospital acquired infections, we did a project recently with that. And also um, the company that has virtual reality glasses has done a project, is working on a project at University of Michigan Dearborn. I just wanted to mention because I think it's interesting, we've also done a lot of projects in the area of hunting. So being able to prevent deer from hearing the hunter, smelling the hunter, and also um, baiting them. So I mean it just is surprising, especially because they all kind of came through as a cluster. Uh, these are the universities that we work with. So this has also been a great way for a group of us to kind of learn about the different universities and their strengths. And that, that's probably the most um, interesting part for me. The companies that we work with are small businesses. And by definition, they're under 500 employees. These are companies that by tapping into university resources, they don't have a research and development group, for instance, they can get their product to market faster and therefore hopefully create jobs for people in our community. They must have the funds up front so we don't, you know, bill them on a monthly basis or something. They have to have it up front. And our team can also help people if they know that they need to do X but are not sure how to do that or who the proper person is to work with. Um, the people that aren't a fit is if a university professor starts a company and then wants to do work in their own lab, um, we just were, would not use taxpayer money to do that. We've worked in a lot of different industries. So one thing that we would like your help with is if you're working with a faculty member and a company has come to them for a project, if you could let us know, we might be able to help with the funding. Um, okay, I'm gonna look at my notes. Um, I'm with Mike Forbes and Tom Zadiba, and Tom and I were just talking. And for, for our part, you know, the company fills out a, a quick application, a non-disclosure agreement, and then we have them complete a project request packet. We call it a PRP. In that, from the researcher point of view, we need a detailed budget, scope of work, timeline, um, the deliverables, and the start date. But after talking to Tom, he was mentioning to me that with him putting together the funding agreement, from you, he needs basically the statement of work and then the fixed price. Okay, oops, it's funny, funny how that turned out. Um, so, so the bottom line is this, this is not a cost sharing program. The university is not putting in any money. It just is a little bit confusing with the University of Michigan because it's administered here. So this is, um, it's uh, the, the company and the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, it's co-funded, but it's not cost sharing because the university is not participating in this. And so also, if you're putting this together in the budget comments, if you could mention that it's an MCERN state matching funds, and MCERN is the Michigan Research Collaboration Network? Corporation, corporate network, sorry. Um, and then also in the PATH title, if you could put skip MCERN match so that it's easy to search, and then including me and Mike Forbes and Steve Wilson so we can follow the project through. And for me, I know about sort of, you know, getting together this project request packet, but Tom Zadiba is a lot more knowledgeable in the work that you do with the creation of the path. So 
we have money till the end of the year or until it runs out. So uh, right now we have a couple of projects in the works with the University of Michigan and the other universities throughout the state. So the sooner we know about a project that you might have in mind, the better. We want to get people into the queue uh, as soon as possible because it's possible by even midsummer we might the funding might be gone. Um, this is the contact information if you have any questions about this. And I have a couple more minutes to open it up to questions if anybody has, has a question. Okay, well, if you think of something, please, you know, let me know. My contact information is here. Um, Tom Zadivas is as well. So thank you. It's actually quite a nice program and, and the envy of some other states because we've been contacted by other states around the country to try and mimic what we've done both with the Michigan Corporate Relations Network and the uh, Small Company Innovation Program. So I think we have a little more time, right? So I've got a few more bicentennial minutes. So in 1993, a major influenza study by the U of M School of Public Health epidemi epidemiologist Arnold Monto in 1993 helped convince Medicare healthcare policymakers to make the seasonal flu vaccine a covered benefit for Americans 65 and up. Uh, in 1998, U of M professor Mark Burns headed up a multidisciplinary team that created miniature laboratory on a chip kits to analyze DNA samples. And some of you may know Mark Burns also as the current director of the M cubed program around campus. Uh, in 2004, the Life Sciences Institute was opened. Uh, it serves as a nucleus of biomedical research at Michigan with an international faculty that represents a constellation of life science disciplines. Uh, they embrace innovation, collaboration, and creative science that has a tangible impact on human health, longevity, and well-being. And moving more to the present, uh, in 2015, U of M opened M City the world's first controlled environment specifically designed to test the potential of connected and automated vehicle technologies that's leading the way to mass market driverless cars. Um, and I think some of you have had a chance to get to tour M City too, which is fun. So I wanted to close with a few quotes from a recent article in the Atlantic Monthly, actually last fall, uh, authored by Jonathan Cole. And it's basically, it's entitled, The Triumph of America's Research University. And he makes the point um, in the arg article that arguably there is no system of higher learning that matches that in the US. Uh, and for example, he has various measures to, to say this, but um, in the world ranking of universities, for example, 75% of the top 50 institutions are American institutions. But it really, again, it, it dates back to that history and the vision of, of Vannevar Bush and the incredible role that the United States government has played in funding peer-reviewed research. And we've held to these core values, and this is what he says in the article, that those core values include meritocracy, organized skepticism, or the willingness to entertain the most radical of ideas, but subject the claims to truth and fact and to the most rigorous scrutiny. Another core value is the creation of new knowledge. Also the peer review system that relies on experts to judge the quality of proposed research that's seeking funding. And then coupled that with academic freedom and free inquiry, really without which no great university can be established. So these really are, and I think we all collectively should be proud of, of what's been created in the United States and, 
and hopefully won't be threatened over the coming years because I think it really does directly equate to our economic prosperity and health uh, relative to the, the rest of the globe. So anyhow, we should all pat ourselves on the back and, and, and celebrate the part we as research administrators play in making that research engine at the University of Michigan really hum. And I encourage all of you, as we wrap up this meeting, um, to again join us across the hallway um, to celebrate a few specific individuals for their contributions over the years. Uh, a reminder, uh, number one, if you've got, um, am I stealing your stuff here? Uh, if you've got ideas for future meetings, to please submit those to the, I guess, the RAC Communications Subcommittee who plans these meetings. Uh, the next RAN meeting will be October 24th, 2017, this exact same place. Um, and yeah, I think I turn it back over to you for a, a simple goodbye. I just wanted to take a quick opportunity to thank Daryl and, and all of the people who have emceed our meetings here. They do a really great job and, and put a lot of effort. And, and Daryl, thank you, you know, uh, presenting a little bit about the history and, and showing your, your care about research that happens here in research administration. So I just want to take the opportunity to thank, um, uh, thank the emcees and Daryl in particular for this meeting. Thank you all. And, and yes, please join us next door. Um, there are lots of good, uh, you know, treats and and desserts over there, um, so please join us. Thank you.